stylized, and that is how writing actually began. It was the stylization, it was the simplification of these basic symbols. And that gave birth to the first real bit of writing, cuneiform, from Sumeria. They were the first to use cuneiform. And you see all of these tiny little symbols, those are little symbols that you just saw the evolution of. Now this is from the mid-third millennium, so it took a while to get there. And they moved away from the pictograms. These were actual letters and not just representations of pictures. What's also interesting is this was the beginning of portable writing. This is actually a letter detailing a battle win. And people were able to send letters and able to send stories. And it still wasn't a commonplace thing. People weren't writing, the average people. This was still scribes and learned people. But it was the beginning, and people were beginning to know things. That is about a foot by a foot. It's pretty small. This one is from the mid second millennium, 2000 BCE. Like between 2500 and 2000 BCE. These used a very different, unique style. Before this, writing had been mostly imprinting. These people used the proto-pen, a.k.a. the stylus, and they would use the stylus to punch into the clay. What's really important is that in Sumeria, they didn't use dragging on the clay. They poked. And that was really interesting, because you'd think, even for letters that were round and long, it was all poking. What was also interesting about this is they were able to use it as decoration and writing at the same time. And also with these changes, they, left, they were able to read left to right in horizontal layers. And this made it a lot easier to read than the ancient Egyptian that could be read any which way. They finally reached a standard. Yes? No. <laughs> I wish I could. <laughs> Oh, that's a lot of craziness. <laughs> I wish I could. <laughs> when you look at the basic word paper, it comes from papyrus. And papyrus was made in Egypt in the mid-third millennium. The thing with writing is that all of these different advancements and different stages were going on concurrently. And it was through the advancement of all these separate civilizations that our version of writing was able to come into being. Papyrus is layers of dried papyri plant fibers, where you take off the outside and then you make them into long layers, you soak them and you dry them and you have a paper-like substance. And papyrus was cool because you could use both ink or paint, and you could use it without having to carve, it was much easier, it was portable. Now, papyrus did have its drawbacks. It couldn't fold it without cracking, it always had to be rolled into scrolls and you had to use an extremely long scroll for any sort of story that was detailed or longer, but it was cheap and it was easy to produce and they made millions of them. And what's really interesting about papyrus is that it was still used in Egypt for some official documents until the year 1000. They had such an attachment to this because it had been the fruit of Egypt and the fruit of writing. I love the Mayans. I'm a South and Mesoamerican nerd, so I like to talk about them a little bit. Mayan writing is a little bit younger, but the cool thing about Mayans developed completely separately from anything in the old world. And they're frequently called Maya glyphs because when people came over, the conquistadors, they looked at them and they said, oh wow, those look like the hieroglyphics from the ancient Egyptians. So colloquially they're known as glyphs, but they're also symbols. The oldest version is from 300 BC in San Bartolo in Guatemala. What's really interesting about Mayan writing is that we don't see basic Mayan. Everything that's written is used in a separate literary version. Sometimes the elite spoke it, but it was mainly just used for writing. Now, we can read 90% of ancient Mayan, but that 10% is really important, and we still have no idea, and we've been working on it for a while. The cool thing about Mayan writing is that it was usually written in blocks in columns, two layers wide. So you would read one column down and then the other column down. The, the idea of columns in writing is so fascinating because it went completely across the ocean without ever having made it. It was just something innate into humankind. And that's absolutely incredible. Mind writing is also cool because individual symbols can represent an entire word or part of a syllable, like ancient Egyptian. You can look at, there's a lot of compound, like a how. A how would be the word for Lord, and that would be the compound of the Ahau symbol 
and the symbol of where he was born. So they would combine that and that would be his name. These are basic Maya glyphs. Maya glyphs were very, very colorful in their general form. I like emblem glyphs because they also represent two different ideas and that's one main symbol with two minor and you can tell the entire story of a war based on that. You have the victor, the loser, and what it was about. Emblem glyphs are fantastic. And then, at the same time, we had a little bit different route taken by the Greeks and the Romans. They, instead, of using part, instead of using papyrus, they used vellum and parchment, which are both animal hides that are limed. They're not tanned like leather, they use lime on them. And they made codices, or books. Now this guy, this is really cool. This is a wax tablet that the Romans were known for. It was a thin little lake of wax that was melted. And what was really cool is it was reusable. You would send a message, you would close it up, and then send it away. And they had styluses, like when you were using in Assyria. But they weren't as easy to use, so it was much harder to get an accurate representation than papyrus or parchment. And I just love it. This is what the phrase, having a clean slate, is from. Yeah, it's one of those things that's been carried through time. And also, when you read Homer's epic, The Iliad, there's this mention of kill the bearer of this message that is sent in one of these where the lid is closed. And so they were very useful in ancient wars because they were the first books. They were closed, and you see these guys. These are seals, so you would know any time that anyone opened one. And after the Greco-Roman world, we saw the evolution of our own alphabet. And I could go through every single letter and tell you interesting facts about them, but we would be here until about 9.30. So I picked a few of my favorites. <laughs> the letter A is the first letter of the Latin and Greek alphabets, and it's traced back to the hieroglyph for an ox's head. It's the third most commonly used letter in English. It denotes quality or accomplishment in the modern idea, and in the mathematical field, it, an upside down capital A is used to signify something that is true for anything and all. What's really cool about A is that it's the idea of acophony, which is, sounds like the first letter of the word. When you say ox, you're not making an O sound, you're making an aw sound. So aw, ox, developed out of that. And I found these amazing pictures that show you <laughs> exactly how the letters developed from the ox's head in both Proto-Semitic and Egyptian and the Phoenician alphabet that you can kind of see is based off of these. Moving head and then moving to Greek, Etruscan, and Roman Cyrillic that we use today. C is also very interesting because it comes from the same letter as G. The, what's really cool is that the ancient Egyptian refers to two different hieroglyphs that could be the ancestor of Gimel or Camel. C has undergone a major transformation, as you can see, in modern times, thanks to the Celts. When you look at words like break, kin, and verses, you see the k sound associated with a k. When the Celts were in charge of the language before the Norman invasion, the c sound made a k for Celt. But you look at the modern world and you look like cookie. It's a different sound. The Norman invasion brought k for the ck sound, whereas c still represents an s Celtic or Celtic sound in front of vowels, for example, in ace or assage. And I just really think it's interesting how C has undergone a complete, not only transformation, but reversal of the sides. You don't see that in a lot of letters. E, I love the Egyptian hieroglyph for, so that's why I chose it. E is the most commonly used letter in a thousand languages. In Czech, Danish, English, French, German, Hungarian, Latin, Norwegian, Spanish, and Swedish. Now the proto-Semitic man was either praying or calling. And you think of like when you make a calling noise, you can make an ah or an e. You think of, it's come a weird direction, but it's come that way. Now the Egyptian hieroglyph had a completely different pronunciation, which was a Q sound. So we're not quite sure when that change occurred from a Q to an H to an E, but it has happened. And the interesting thing about E is that several modern authors have tried and successfully completed works without using the letter E, but each of them say that it's been the hardest thing that they've ever had to write, is using a, writing a book without the letter E. You think of 
It is the most commonly used letter in the language. You cannot